Hi there. I'm glad you're back to read God's Word together with me. This is day number 18 in the Digging Deeper Daily reading calendar, and today we read Genesis 31, Job 18, and Mark 11. So let's turn to Genesis 31. Yesterday we heard of the rivalry between Rachel and Leah and about more sons for Jacob, whose names all have meanings appropriate to what Rachel or Leah were feeling at the time. Genesis 31 Jacob heard that Laban's sons were saying, Jacob has taken everything that belonged to our father. He got all his wealth from what our father owned. He also saw that Laban was no longer as friendly as he had been earlier. Then the Lord said to him, Go back to the land of your fathers and your relatives. I will be with you. So Jacob sent word to Rachel and Leah to meet him in the field where his flocks were. He said to them, I have noticed that your father is not as friendly toward me as he used to be, but my father's God has been with me. You both know that I have worked for your father with all my strength. Yet he has cheated me and changed my wages ten times. But God did not let him harm me. Whenever Laban said, The speckled goats will be your wages, all the flocks produced speckled young. When he said, The striped goats shall be your wages, all the flocks produced striped young. God has taken flocks away from your father and given them to me. During the breeding season I had a dream, and I saw that the male goats that were mating were striped, spotted, and speckled. The angel of God spoke to me in the dream and said, Jacob, yes, I answered. Look, he continued, all the male goats that are mating are striped, spotted, and speckled. I am making this happen because I have seen all that Laban is doing to you. I am the God who appeared to you at Bethel, where you dedicated a stone as a memorial by pouring olive oil on it, and where you made a vow to me. Now get ready and go back to the land where you were born. Rachel and Leah answered Jacob, There is nothing left for us to inherit from our father. He treats us like foreigners. He sold us, and now he has spent all the money he was paid for us. All this wealth which God has taken from our Father belongs to us and to our children. Do whatever God has told you. So Jacob got ready to go back to his father in the land of Canaan. He put his children and his wives on the camels and drove all his flocks ahead of him with everything that he had gotten in Mesopotamia. Laban had gone to shear his sheep, and during his absence, Rachel stole the household gods that belonged to her father. Jacob deceived Laban by not letting him know that he was leaving. He took everything he owned and left in a hurry. He crossed the Euphrates River and started for the hill country of Gilead. Three days later, Laban was told that Jacob had fled. He took his men with him and pursued Jacob for seven days until he caught up with him in the hill country of Gilead. In a dream that night, God came to Laban and said to him, Be careful not to threaten Jacob in any way. Jacob had set up his camp on a mountain, and Laban set up his camp with his relatives in the hill country of Gilead. Laban said to Jacob, Why did you deceive me and carry off my daughters like women captured in war? Why did you deceive me and slip away without telling me? If you had told me, I would have sent you on your way with rejoicing and singing to the music of tambourines and harps. You did not even let me kiss my grandchildren and my daughters goodbye. That was a foolish thing to do. I have the power to do you harm, but last night the God of your fathers warned me not to threaten you in any way. I know that you left because you were so anxious to get back home, but why did you steal my household gods? Jacob answered, I was afraid because I thought you might take your daughters away from me, but if you find that anyone here has your gods, he will be put to death. Here, with our men as witnesses, look for anything that belongs to you and take what is yours. Jacob did not know that Rachel had stolen Laban's gods. Laban went and searched Jacob's tent. 
Then he went to Leah's tent and the tent of the two slave women, but he did not find his gods. Then he went to Rachel's tent. Rachel had taken the household gods and put them in a camel's saddlebag and was sitting on them. Laban searched through the whole tent but did not find them. Rachel said to her father, Do not be angry with me, sir, but I'm not able to stand up in your presence. I'm having my monthly period. Laban searched but did not find his household gods. Then Jacob lost his temper. What crime have I committed? What law have I broken that gives you the right to hunt me down? Now that you've searched through all my belongings, what household article have you found that belongs to you? Put it out here where your men and mine can see it, and let them decide which one of us is right. I have been with you now for twenty years. Your sheep and your goats have not failed to reproduce, and I have not eaten any rams from your flocks. Whenever a sheep was killed by wild animals, I always bore the loss myself. I didn't take it to you to show that it was not my fault. You demanded that I make good anything that was stolen during the night or during the day. Many times I suffered from the heat during the day and from the cold at night. I was not able to sleep. It was like that for the whole twenty years I was with you. For fourteen years I worked to win your two daughters, and six years for your flocks. And even then, you changed my wages ten times. If the God of my fathers, the God of Abraham and Isaac, had not been with me, you would have already sent me away empty-handed. But God has seen my trouble and the work that I have done, and last night he gave his judgment. Laban answered Jacob, These young women are my daughters. Their children belong to me, and these flocks are mine. In fact, everything you see here belongs to me. But since I can do nothing to keep my daughters and their children, I'm ready to make an agreement with you. Let us make a pile of stones to remind us of our agreement. So Jacob got a stone and set it up as a memorial. He told his men to gather some rocks and pile them up. Then they ate a meal beside the pile of rocks. Laban named it Jeger Sahadutha, while Jacob named it Gale Ed. Laban said to Jacob, This pile of rocks will be a reminder for both of us. That is why the place is named Gale Ed. Laban also said, May the Lord keep an eye on us while we are separated from each other. So the place was named Mizpah. Laban went on, If you mistreat my daughters, or if you marry other women, even though I don't know about it, remember that God is watching us. Here are the rocks that I have piled up between us, and here is the memorial stone. Both this pile and this memorial stone are reminders. I will never go beyond this pile to attack you, and you must never go beyond it or beyond this memorial stone to attack me. The God of Abraham and the God of Nahor will judge between us. Then, in the name of the God whom his father Isaac worshipped, Jacob solemnly vowed to keep this promise. He killed an animal, which he offered as a sacrifice on the mountain, and he invited his men to the meal. After they had eaten, they spent the night on the mountain. Early the next morning, Laban kissed his grandchildren and his daughters goodbye and left to go back home. Let's prepare to read Job 18. Yesterday, Job again complained that he was surrounded by mockers and despairingly again said, Where is there any hope for me? Who sees any? Hope will not go with me when I go down to the world of the dead. Job 18. Bildad responds to Job. Job, can't people like you ever be quiet? If you stop to listen, we could talk to you. What makes you think we are as stupid as cattle? You are only hurting yourself with your anger. Will the earth be deserted because you are angry? Will God move mountains to satisfy you? The light of the wicked will still be put out. Its flame will never burn again. The lamp in their tents will be darkened. Their steps were firm, but now they stumble. 
they fall victims of their own advice. They walk into a net and their feet are caught. A trap catches their heels and holds them. On the ground a snare is hidden. A trap has been set in their path. All around them terror is waiting. It follows them at every step. The wicked used to be rich, but now they go hungry. Disaster stands and waits at their side. A deadly disease spreads over their bodies and causes their arms and legs to rot. They are torn from the tents where they lived secure. They are dragged off to face King Death. Now anyone may live in their tents after sulfur is sprinkled to disinfect them. Their roots and branches are withered and dry. Their fame is ended at home and abroad. No one remembers them anymore. The wicked will be driven out of the land of the living, driven from the light into darkness. They have no descendants, no survivors. From east to west, all who hear their fate shudder and tremble with fear. That is the fate of evil people, the fate of those who care nothing for God. And now let's turn to Mark 11. Jesus by now has prepared his disciples for his death by prophesying about it and by teaching them about what it will be like to lead in his kingdom. And he healed Bartimaeus, who called Jesus by his messianic title, the Son of David. Mark 11. As they approached Jerusalem, near the towns of Bethphage and Bethany, they came to the Mount of Olives. Jesus sent two of his disciples on ahead with these instructions. Go to the village there ahead of you. As soon as you get there, you will find a colt tied up that has never been ridden. Untie it and bring it here. And if someone asks you why you're doing that, Say that the master needs it, and will send it back at once. So they went and found a colt out in the street, tied to the door of a house. As they were untying it, some of the bystanders asked them, What are you doing untying that colt? They answered just as Jesus had told them, and the people let them go. They brought the colt to Jesus, threw their cloaks over the animal, and Jesus got on. Many people spread their cloaks on the road, while others cut branches in the field and spread them on the road. The people who were in front and those who followed behind began to shout, Praise God! God bless him who comes in the name of the Lord! God bless the coming kingdom of King David, our father! Praise be to God! Jesus entered Jerusalem, went into the temple, and looked around at everything. But since it was already late in the day, he went out to Bethany with the twelve disciples. The next day, as they were coming back from Bethany, Jesus was hungry. He saw in the distance a fig tree covered with leaves, so he went to see if he could find any figs on it. But when he came to it, he found only leaves, because it was not the right time for figs. Jesus said to the fig tree, No one shall ever eat figs from you again. And his disciples heard him. When they arrived in Jerusalem, Jesus went to the temple and began to drive out all those who were buying and selling. He overturned the tables of the money changers and the stools of those who sold pigeons, and he would not let anyone carry anything through the temple courts. He then taught the people, It is written in the scriptures that God said, My temple will be called a house of prayer for the people of all nations, but you have turned it into a hideout for thieves. The chief priests and the teachers of the law heard this, so they began looking for some way to kill Jesus. They were afraid of him because the whole crowd was amazed at his teaching. When evening came, Jesus and his disciples left the city. Early next morning, as they walked along the road, 
they saw the fig tree. It was dead all the way down to its roots. Peter remembered what had happened and said to Jesus, Look, teacher, the fig tree you cursed has died. Jesus answered them, Believe fully in God. I assure you that whoever tells this hill to get up and throw itself in the sea and does not doubt in his heart but believes that what he says will happen, it will be done for him. For this reason I tell you, when you pray and ask for something, believe that you have received it, and you will be given whatever you ask for. And when you stand and pray, forgive anything that you may have against anyone, so that your Father in heaven will forgive the wrongs you have done. They arrived once again in Jerusalem. As Jesus was walking in the temple, the chief priests, the teachers of the law, and the elders came to him and asked him, What right do you have to do these things? Who gave you such right? Jesus answered them, I will ask you just one question, and if you give me an answer, I will tell you what right I have to do these things. Tell me. Where did John's right to baptize come from? Was it from God or from human beings? They started to argue among themselves. What shall we say? If we answer, from God, he will say, Why then did you not believe John? But if we say, from human beings, they were afraid of the people because everyone was convinced that John had been a prophet. So their answer to Jesus was, We don't know. Jesus said to them, Neither will I tell you, then, by what right I do these things. Let's pray together. Our Lord Christ Jesus, our Savior, Today we heard how you acted out a parable. You cursed that fig tree, because when you came looking for fruit, you didn't find any. And, Lord, we pray that when you come to examine us, us individually and also our churches, that you would find fruit. Seeing what you did in the temple, we pray that our churches would not be a place of commerce, but would be called a house of prayer for the peoples of all nations. And Lord, when they returned to that fig tree and saw what had happened, you taught them, when you pray and ask for something, believe that you have received it, and you will be given whatever you ask for. Lord, we pray that we would come to you in believing prayer, and that we would ask things for your glory, for those are the things that matter the most in bearing fruit for you. And you said that when we pray, we need to forgive anything that we may have against anyone, so that our Father will forgive us. Lord, I pray that you would make us aware of our grudges against others, and help us to forgive those people. Father in heaven, we ask for Christ's sake that you would forgive our sins as we confess them today.